The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone, to today's webinar. I'm Andy Blanchard, and I lead our Emerging Issues team here at Veris. Our presentation today is titled PFAS Trends in Research. If you don't know much about PFAS, you've come to the right place. Uh, although, if you want to know what PFAS stands for, you're going to need to wait because I'm definitely not going to try to pronounce that word. But with that, let's uh, let's jump as we do immediately into the chairperson statement. The policy of various analytics and subsidiary companies is to comply in all respects with federal and state antitrust laws. With this in mind, we want to mention that during all seminars held under auspices, this policy prohibits discussion of certain topics. Because we want to avoid even the appearance of an antitrust violation, we go beyond the letter of the law and will not discuss any matter that violates the spirit of the antitrust laws or could be perceived as doing so. A copy of our policy statement on discussion at meetings can be found at barris.com slash statement. And to ensure uh, that we stay on track here, Veris attorney Kerry Ayala is on the phone with us. Kerry, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hi, my name is Carrie. I'm an attorney in the law department here at Ferris, as Andy just mentioned. I know many of you are likely familiar with our policy governing discussions at meetings, uh, particularly where there's many entities on the call. So I'd just like to remind everyone participating, uh, there shouldn't be any discussion of lost costs, rates, uh, or of corporate policies or intentions of any company in the industry um, for the discussions here that take place are confidential. So should we get off track, I'll chime in but I hope to stay quiet for the meeting. So with that, I'll send it back to you, Andy. Great, thank you, Carrie. Uh, so, you know, we do have a sizable audience on the line and I would encourage everyone, if you have questions or comments, please use the chat function and go to webinar. Um, and we will definitely leave some time at the end for Q and A. So no need to wait for the Q and A portion at the end. If a question pops up in your head, just go ahead and put it into the chat and uh, we'll endeavor to address it towards the end. Also, one last note, um, please note that we will, for participating companies, be sending out a circular of the slides that you're about to see, uh, as well as we plan to put a recording of the actual presentation at veris.com slash EI. So just know that those are coming, no need to ask about that, and um, you can hopefully sit back and, and learn more about PFAS. So, I am really excited to introduce Dr. Rainer Lohman. He's a professor at University of Rhode Island and director of STEEP, which stands for Sources, Transport, Exposure, and Effects of PFAS, which is a research center uh, sponsored by the NIH. Professor Lohman has well over 20 years of experience as a scientist and leads one of only 23 Superfund research centers in the US, a highly regarded oceanographer and chemist. Professor Lohman's research focuses on the transport and fate of recalcitrant organic compounds, including pollutants such as PFAS. So with that, Professor Lohman, welcome, thank you, and please take it away. Good morning, everybody, and thanks to the various team for inviting me. So let me talk a little bit about these unpronounceable chemicals that in common parlance, we also refer to as forever chemicals. So, oops, um, quick overview, I'll talk a little bit on PFAS's, then I touch on a few aspects of what our research center does in respect to PFAS. I'll talk about sources, source assessment of PFAS, implications for health, how we, how we are the community at large and talks about PFAS, and then some ways of addressing the restriction of PFAS. We're essentially using them, and I'll finish with some outlook because, as everybody's aware, these are very exciting times, if that's the right way, in terms of PFAS. A lot is happening at state, federal, and global levels. So there's a lot of action. Um, excuse me, um, while I'm getting back to my slides. So PFAS um, have resulted in the combination of hundreds of sites in the US, three most prevalent and uh, uh, sites that have been contaminated by aqueous transforming foam, so military sites and airports where they are used as for fire training and of course fire extinguishing. But also we have industrial sites, particularly where 
fluorinated chemicals have been made. So that would be around the 3M, DuPont, Kimur facilities, but also manufacturers that have used their products. But the exposure is far beyond those particular sites. Basically every American has PFASs in them and that suggests that there's exposure through uh, other means and that probably is likely consumer products, um, food contact materials, stuff and consumer products such as textiles that are coated, coated carpets and so on. I'll get into the health effects a little later but there are certain health effects that have raised concerns which have resulted in unusually strict drinking water guidelines so far. And there has been some action by EPA through a voluntary agreement with major industries to uh, remove two of the worst offending chemicals. But of course, as the demand for the products hasn't gone away, novel chemistry has taken their place and we often think of those as regrettable substitutions. So you probably often hear that there are thousands of PFASs and that's certainly true, but some of those are mostly on the books. Now, industry claims they've only produced really a couple of hundreds, but it's difficult to verify because of confidential business information. So it's not entirely clear what is really produced and how much and where. And we know that even the most ambitious state or federal monitoring approaches only target tens of PFASs. And right now, EPA has only issued health advisories for two, PFOA and PFOS. So you see there's a little discrepancy between what could be out there and what we know about. On the right-hand side is a figure that actually breaks the per and polyfluoroalkyl substance into groups. So the non-polymers are the perfluory, and there's, these are basically molecules. Perfluoroalkyl substances are compounds that have a carbon backbone and then typically have either a carboxylic or sulfonic head group. PFOS and PFOA are among those. And those are very persistent. They don't really break down naturally. Below that are polyfluoroalkyl. They still have carbon fluorine backbone, but they have somewhere carbons that are not fluorinated. And that is only important because that makes those carbons live, prone to being attacked. And so those polyfluoroalkyl can be broken down. And this happens regularly in treatment plants, for example. But the end products then are stable again. And so the polyfluoroalkyl often turn into perfluoroalkyl. And then those are again persistent and stable. On the right hand side are polymers. And fluoropolymers, probably most famous, is Teflon. So large molecules, sorry, um, linked monomers that lead to large, um, typically then particles. Then we have perfluoropolyethers. Um, they have oxygen in their backbones. Gen X is one of those. And then with side chain fluorinated polymers, this is where you have a normal polymer that has a fluorinated entity grafted onto it. And that, that those might have been sometimes used to um, confer stain repellency to carpets or alike. So that's kind of the universe. If you want to know more, and I'm sure there's plenty of chemists who love those kinds of slides, just to say that's a breakdown of the different families. Up here are the carboxylic acids with the COH group, then come the sulfonic acids, then you go on and on. So there's plenty of chemicals out there, chemical groups that are all under this umbrella of PFASs. Uh, the main point is that we have done a good research looking into very few of them, and there's plenty of them where we know very little. Um, the, on the federal side, maybe 24, depending on which method is used, which agencies involved are actually looked at in, in typical research. One thing that we I want to point out because it's, I think it's important. So the typical serum profile, so what is in our blood, is to be dominated by compounds like PFOS or the shorter six carbon version of it that's in light blue here. So these are blood profiles from the Germans. And then there's some of the PFOA, so this would be in this mauve, whatever color that is. And then there's black, and black means there's something in our blood, but we don't know actually what it is. We just know it has carbon fluorine bonds. So it's certainly a man-made chemical and the fraction of the unknown seems to be increasing towards more modern times. And that suggests that indeed we have had change in the use of formulations and chemicals. And so now we have some substitutions that still end up in, in humans, 
but we don't know what those are, and that's not a very good thing. So, with, with that background, STEEP was funded five years ago. STEEP stands for the Source Suspense but Exposure and Effects of PFASs. And if you go to uri.edu slash STEEP, you can see more about it. Here's the quick overview. I'll touch on some of these. We have research program on environmental flight and transport of PFAS. I'll touch more on those. We have two projects that look at the toxicology and human health impacts of PFAS. I'll get back into those. And my own research looks into the detection by accumulation of PFASs. The other things that are part of the center is a training core for graduate students. I'll talk a little bit more about research translation and community engagement. Those are hallmarks of the Superfund centers. And of course, we have an administrative core that hopefully is always behind the scenes. So the fingerprinting, there's different ways of trying to figure out where PFASs are from. And so an easy way is to distinguish the plume resulting from the historical use of aqueous film forming foams or AFFFs. And that's because AFFFs are a fruit mixture of a range of chemicals, but they have very unique composition. So that is fairly easy to distinguish from what's coming out of a wastewater treatment plant. Wastewater treatment plants, of course, um, funnel all of our gray water. And that includes then anything and everything that is is a was on our bodies and gets flushed out and so they have a very different consumer product profile in a way and then of course there's industry specific uses of PFASs and they often have very unique characteristic profiles so these are ways i um, just looking at the, the fingerprints or the abundance of different PFASs helps us figure out where those three are um, of course, then there's another ways. Some chemicals were only produced by a certain manufacturer, like PFOS was manufactured only by 3M in the US. They've later switched to PFPS, so those are typically indications that 3M would have been involved. GenX is a replacement chemical for PFOA that has been used by Kimuas extensively, and that is very specific to what they've done. Um, Kimuas also produces a Membrane called Nafion, and that has some byproducts, and of course, again, specific to that particular way of producing that membrane. And then, lastly, I'll get into that a little bit. The examples I showed earlier, of course, are sometimes very easy because we know fire training has happened. We just have to look down gradient. We know where wastewater treatments are located. We know where industries are located, often, not always, but often, and what they use. And honestly, more. Research side, we find plenty of PFASs in the Arctic at lower concentration, of course, but nonetheless, we do find them. And there was a question, where do they come from? And that's where fingerprinting again helps us figure out the transport pathways. All right, so here's an example from Cape Cod, which is where our community engagement is located and some of our research. And so on the map on the right, you see part of Cape Cod and you see in blue, a transect uh, or a sampling along a stream. And in the bubble, you see this had fairly high concentration up to 660 parts per trillion along that entire stream. But if you go only a few miles further east, you get a very low residual concentration of only 10 or 9 parts per trillion. And in the next slide, it'll, it's going to be clear why, because the transect on the left is affected by prior use of AFFF at a fire training area at the Dawn Base Cape Cod. And that AFFF over time, years, decades, has seeped through the soil and has been washed down with consecutive rains to reach the aquifer that is below the ground on Cape Cod. Now there's a second infiltration, that's where the wastewater treatment plant is discharging its effluent. And because Cape Cod relies on an aquifer, there was the noble aim to replenish the aquifer by having the effluent go back into the ground. Of course, now we know that that also led to the transport of PFASs on precursors into the groundwater. And then what you get is basically a plume of PFASs below the surface. And this is always shown here. You see a range, a number of slides that always show on the surface, the above elevation, and then you see the groundwater table. And then depending on the color, you see the of certain compounds. So the first is actually all oxygen. It's all very rich in oxygen until you get a plume, and that is because the wastewater treatment plant 
put so much organic matter into the ground that the bacteria basically chew away all um, the organic matter and deplete the oxygen. But more importantly for us, there's a plume of PFOS, PFOS, which is one of the two main regulated items by EPA, and we see some of the precursors. So basically the groundwater in that region has plenty of different PFASs below the ground on Cape Cod. And at this point, there's really nothing you can do other than treat the water that you retrieve. And so you can use this kind of site to do this fingerprinting exercise, and then you can distinguish very nicely that certain chemicals only show up in water that is affected by, by use of AFFF, so the firefighting foams. And then you have other sites like the streams further east where there's very low concentration. And of course, those are then infected by something else. And that is typically consumer product. So a very generic abundance of PFAS is not specific to one particular point source. So that's one way to distinguishing sources of PFAS. On the left-hand side, you see the circle. This is a very different cohort. This is research on the Faroe Islands in the middle of the Atlantic. They eat a lot of seafood, including whales. And then you can distinguish those uh, mothers who ate a lot of whales and their children have a lot more of, in this case, longer chain PFAS because they um, tend to bioaccumulate much more strongly. And up in uh, up opposite, you see compounds that are more generic and that's probably from exposure in the homes themselves. So these are the kind of tools you can use to assess where compounds are coming from. My own research is looking at detection tools and we use what we call passive sampling tools. So these are devices that we leave out and they accumulate and integrate typically PFAS over days or weeks of deployment. And that helps us um, derive what are typical concentrations in, let's say, a surface water where concentration might fluctuate. So instead of having to go out every day to take a grab sample, we leave our tools out for weeks on end. And then at the end of our deployment period, we can say, all right, a typical concentration would be X or Y. And that'll become important as states grapple with what how they should regulate surface waters. And that, of course, sometimes leads to fish advisories. So this is just one example of what we do. We use these little tubes, we fill them with a solvent that attracts the PFASs and we deploy several of them in a treatment plant near to where we live. And basically we see that they're nicely integrated over time. And that gives us the, the power to know how quickly compounds are taken up so we can use this validation to use them at other sites. A um, little more fancy chemistry, working with folks at Brown University, which are just of the state. Um, they make nanographene, so size less than a dime, and that will help us to attract PFAS that we want to measure in things like in the sediment or in the soil, where we know whatever is dissolved there is actually what is taken out by iota, so it's a good proxy for bioaccumulation, and of course that is what's leading them to fish advisories. And to add a lot of chemistry, all of this the folks at Brown actually modified the surface, added a nice amine groups, and that actually helps us improve the selectivity for the wide range of PFSs that a lot of people are interested in. So we basically try to measure everything from EFPA, which has four carbons, to the tetradecanoic acid, which has 14 carbons. So that's the range of PFS you can actually find in the environment. Same here, you know, the PFOS, the PFBS is the replacement for the PFOS that has been phased out. And you see some of the other compounds that is, those are polyfluorinated, so they will break down eventually, either in the natural environment or in biota. Here you see the GNX, the replacement compound by Kimuras, and some of the chemicals that we find in um, firefighting forms. The other thing that we did, and this is a study that looked at birds from three different locations, um, Narragansett Bay, so obviously in Rhode Island, offshore of Massachusetts Bay, Starbuck Bank National Park, so this is offshore. And then the Cape Fear River estuary where there's plenty of fluorochemical production stream. And maybe not a big surprise, the birds from the Cape Fear had much greater concentration than the other sites, but even the other sites that we consider fairly background 
have detectable concentration of PFASs. And again, we see in the Cape Fear River that we find two unique chemicals that are specific to the manufacturing, or must, must result from manufacturing of certain uh, membranes. Um, one of them is the Nafian byproduct tube, but there's another one. So again, these are site-specific, compound-specific, probably industry-specific markers that would indicate contamination from that region. All right, last thing, and we'll get back to that in a little bit, we also move indoors. So we rely on the same sampling pools indoors. And what we detect are some of these precursor chemicals. Uh, in this case, it's called a 6 to fqh which just means it has six fully fluorinated carbons, two CH groups, and then it has an alcohol group. Those might be used in paints, but also in surfac repellents. And we realized how we can use them and validated them in a range of um, outdoor gear, clothing store, and then we used them in kindergartens and offices, just to get an idea how prevalent the chemicals are, and I get back to that a little later on. So, um, one of the questions that we and others, of course, are trying to address is how do PFSs reach a remote place like the Arctic? And there's really only two and a half ways of getting there. There's an atmospheric pathway, which traditionally has been very important for chemicals because the atmosphere moves very fast. We know we have major production regions in North America, Europe, Russia. So a lot of chemicals that we are concerned with in the Arctic have come through atmospheric transport. But PFAS are a little unique because they're also very water soluble, which also is a problem because that means the remo their removal from water, drinking water is not that easy. So because they're water soluble, the alternatives they could also just move with the ocean currents of the Arctic. And so both hypotheses have been discussed and explored. And so we went on a major research cruise to the Arctic um, almost 10 years ago by now and looked at water coming in from the North Atlantic, looking at the Central Arctic. We're going to figure out what we can learn about the presence and, of course, where they're coming from. And in case you don't know this, the Arctic is highly stratified. We have a fairly shallow polar mixed layer that is very rapid exchange with the atmosphere. So it's only representing the last year or so. We have a slightly deeper mixed layer that's called the halocline. So we're, it's a little warmer above and a little more fresh water that is mixed on the timescale of 10 years. Then comes Atlantic water that is maybe 25 years old. And then very deep water is much, much older. So if only movement with water is driving distribution in the Arctic, then the deep water is so old that it would have never ever seen a perfluorinated chemical because they haven't been produced, or they've only been produced for the last 50, 60 years. Now, without going into great details, the key part is we show profiles from four sites in the Arctic, and the deep water is always clean of PFAS at the very bottom, no test. The Atlantic water is basically free of PFAS except at one site, and that site is the one closest to the Atlantic Ocean. So what we think we are starting to see here is the movement of PFASs with the North Atlantic water moving slowly into the Arctic. But the main story then basically is that highest PFAS concentration are in the surface layer. And surface layer, of course, is with fast exchange with the atmosphere. So this is already an indication that atmospheric transport, again, is probably very important. Another way to look at this is we look at some of the slush and ice that was coming part of the Arctic and if we analyze those samples we see concentration are not greater again suggesting that the atmospheric deposition was going to be important and lastly this is again a fingerprinting technique we know from measurements on ice caps by other people of course by other researchers that there's a certain ratio of chemicals that is present if you have atmospheric deposition only and we see a similar ratio at most of our snow sites so again, suggesting that, um, that atmospheric transport was important. And then if we ran an ocean model with colleagues at Harvard, basically we can then predict that over the next few decades, the um, ocean travel will become more important, particularly as some of the more volatile, easily transportable precursors are probably going to be phased out. 
So that was a real, real life fingerprinting exercise. All right, on to the health. So what we do know is often based on work that was done by collaborator Philippe Rangeon from the Harvard School of Public Health. And he has been working at a very unique site, the Faroe Islands, with um, the local leading expert, Paul Waihi, who works in the Faris Hospital. And so what the two came up with is to rely on this small community of maybe 70,000 people who have a unique diet because they eat a lot of fish and sometimes the whales. And because of this particular uh, consumption of whales, the concern was that they would have a high exposure to mercury and then later PCBs and our PFESs. Of course, we know that is true. And it, the health effect was seen as so damaging that at this point, the Faroe Islands health authorities have issued the guidelines for women not to eat whale meat. And by and large, most women have followed that. Most women have followed that advice. Most men have not. So let's take a look at what effects we actually see. So this is one of those wonderful plots. Um, if you want to know the details, the log scale on the, on the x axis, the y axis is the production of antibodies. So this is a test because basically every child on the pharaohs gets um, vaccinated routinely. Philippe and Paul decided that they would use this routine vaccination episode as a test to see how well the body responds. And of course, once you get the vaccine, you produce antibodies. And if you're healthy, then you produce enough antibodies to last till you get a refresher, your booster. But as it turns out, some of the chemicals that are in the children interfere. So what you see here is that as child has more PFOSs in its blood at age five, the antibody production starts to decrease. And of course, we are all fairly well trained now in problems of vaccines and antibody and being protected. So what this suggests is that if individuals have too high concentration of PFOS, the vaccine will actually not be very, will not be effective and not protect them. And this kind of research has basically been one of the key ways of deriving um, benchmark doses, which is then used to derive drinking water limits. The other thing that Arl and Philippe have learned on the Faroe Islands is that the transfer of PFASs happens not only before birth, but also after birth from women to infants through breastfeeding. This is Busy plot, but basically, the longer the mother was breastfeeding, like the one in black, the higher the PFAS concentration were reached in the children. Now, I'm not advocating against breastfeeding, it's just one of those sad, sad moments to realize that some of the chemicals we produce, you uh, can't really avoid passing on to your offspring. Then if they follow their own logic to arrive at a safe dose, it becomes very low. And I'm not going to go into the details, it's just this kind of research then is one of the reasons why over time you start seeing the safe drinking water limits decrease. So in the early days, West Virginia had guideline of 100,000 nanograms per liter, and now less drinking volumes are around 10 nanograms per liter for TFOA, and we see very, very similar story for TFOS. Know that some of the more protective states, particularly in the Northeast, um, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, target six chemicals, and for in several states, it's the sum of those six that should not exceed 20 parts per trillion. So that is a fairly low dose which of course means that you often have to install treatment. Mm, this question on childhood obesity and it's early days, there are plenty of studies that are not fully conclusive. Now don't forget, the problem with all of this research is that there's plenty of confounding factors, lifestyle, other chemicals, what you eat, how much you move, genetics. So it's a very complicated picture. But certainly there's indications on various fronts that chemicals are large are part of the reason why we have uh, basically obesity endemic across much of this rich world. 
Um, last little word, this is our other health or toxic toxicological project. I wanted to show a heat map because who doesn't love to look at the heat map? Basically what it's showing is it shows a range of different chemicals from four carbons all the way to seven carbons. These are carboxylic acids and it shows EFPS and some newer chemicals. And you see almost the same level of intensity in red for a lot of these chemicals regardless of their size and of their dose because they go with three panels. Basically the main message is that in terms of simple toxicity, some of the newer replacement chemicals are just as bad as the old, chem old PFASs. It's just that the um, internal dose is often lower, but the toxicity itself is not really that different. All right, so does exposure to PFAS impact other diseases? Yes, that's of course a hot topic of discussion. If you buy into the logic that PFAS is interfere with the immune system because the immune system is what is leading to the healthy production of antibodies. And of course, if you have an expert PFAS, you have a weakened immune system, and that of course will manifest itself in problems with things like COVID, the flu, or the cold. And there's ongoing research to look into this exactly by looking at, by asking mothers to basically, and I think it's might be text-based or tweet-based, I forgot, how often their children had a flu or a cold or whatever they had, and then later on compile that and compare if this is linked to PFAS, but most likely the answer is yes. And of course, there's plenty of other studies that look into the link to obesity, insulin resistance. We certainly know that from you know, laboratory animal studies that those effects exist and decreasing bone density. So a lot of this is ongoing, but most likely the answer is yes, PFAS will lead to very many other effects. Question came up to we how do we communicate this risk? And it's always a challenge, particularly if you can't pronounce the chemicals, if you can't see them, you can't taste them. So this is all makes it very difficult to convince the public at large or regulators or agencies to do something about it. Um, and like I said, we have a research translation core, and part of their efforts have been to make our website and our materials very user friendly they're very um, choosy in what colors they use what messages because they want to invite people to explore not to get scared but we have a bunch of these are tip cards so these are um, sheets that are handout sheets or load me down sheets that explore certain topics of either what where we can find some of these chemicals in our day to day home what to do if you're going to be a mother, if you're worried about your food, and so on. But we have a big benefit, and that is PFASs have been unusually popular. And by popular, I mean they've actually been leading to three films. So there was a documentary, The Devil We Know, that is based on depositions and testimonies in one of the biggest lawsuits against Dupont. And it basically tells the story of a lawyer that worked for corporate industry and then for whatever reason agreed to help out a friend of his grandmother from the town he grew up and then ends up eventually taking Dupont to court and winning legal battles. There's a more popular version of the same story that is Dark Waters with Mark Ruffalo it's based on both of the same stories. Of course, one is a film, a movie film from Hollywood, the other is just a documentary. Um, but those are certainly very good introductions to um, the chemistry, the politics, the industrial production, and so on on PFAS. So very unusual that you actually have films that explore a topic in great depth. And then lastly, that was just released. There's also No Defense, another documentary that focuses particularly on communities ex um, exposed to aqueous film forming foam and how EOD is trying to work with them or not. All right, so the question came up in the, you know, in case you're worried now, how can you identify the products that contain PFASs? And well, that's a great question, and I wish I could give you a great answer, but the simple answer is I cannot. Here's a 
panel of different uses of PFASs. And basically, in all of these cases, like carpets or cosmetics or clothing, alternatives exist, but often you cannot tell easily. So it's very difficult to avoid PFASs unless you have some time to do your research, and sometimes you need some money too. Um, we work with the community, as I said, of course, they have the same concerns. This case was on Cape Cod, and we were working with people that own private wells because they don't have the screens. So we encourage them to test their water. And we tested already 100, and we're testing another 80 right now all across Cape Cod and try to discuss also with them why did they engage with us or why did they not, as much as we could tell. And the good news is of the 180 samples so far, only a few were above state guidelines. So that's the good news for the Cape. What else can you do? So the town of Barnstable, closest to where the groundwater flows from, where in the plume from the aqueous film forming forms, where from the joint base can cord, and then also the as a regional fire training area, and then of course there's a wastewater treatment plant. So town of Barnstable decided to be proactive, put in major treatment. You can see some of the granular, act granular activated carbon filters they put in. So these are basically huge Brita filters. Um, initial cost for the town, I think Barnstable only serves around 10,000 residential customers, was 12 million. And then they have annual costs of um, replacing the granular activated carbon. I think that happens once or twice a year, and I think that's at a pop is always a few hundred thousand extras. So the town of Barnstable has now engaged lawyers, and they are trying to recoup, recoup their investment from somebody responsible. And the other reason why it's so difficult to remove PFASs is, as I said, they are persistent. And persistency leads to a major problem because that basically means the compound doesn't go away. So even though they were produced for some useful products, either a consumer product or for a triple F, whatever else they were used for, at this stage, those get used or discharged. And of course, we now know the A triple F then seeps through the ground into the water. And consumer products are used, and some of that goes into waste, and it goes into treatments, or they leach onto products that we use as food. We know in our homes we have exposure to air, food, dust, and so eventually they reach us humans. But of course, this is not the end because from us it goes back to treatment plants, which then leads to either contamination of the drinking water or the biosolids, then be, can be used as agricultural fertilizer. And so now they're back into the agricultural food chain, can it reach in plants, which then can be taken up by grazing cattle and then get back to us. So that is an almost never ending cycle of the compounds cycling through because they don't really break down. So that's why the removal is so tricky. I mean, obviously the solution will be to not produce the chemicals in the first place, but that's a little hindsight in 2020. All right, so of course, then the obvious question is how can we reduce exposure, reduce the use? And that really depends. There have been some notable progress and um, mostly not because of federal or state, but mostly not because of federal action at this point. But there's been a lot of pressure on from NGOs or consumers that has led to replacements by certain manufacturers or producers of textiles, cosmetics or furnitures because um, of course there's a certain product or corporate image that doesn't shine well with using chemicals that might be harmful to human health and pollute the environment. Um, some manufacturers have, as a thing as a group, decided to phase out. So I think, I believe, almost all carpets now sold in the US do not have PFASs anymore. And of course, there has been legislative action targeting particularly uh, banning AFFF, like the DOD has basically phased out the use of AFFFs because of um, legislative maneuvering. They've also phased out the use of PFASs on food content materials on, D on DOD procurements. There are several bills that would do the same on states. 
And of course, there's ongoing litigation by various be that exposed communities, certain men, uh, professional groups, states, towns. So there's a lot going on. The, the website, pfastcentral.org, and there lists PFAS free products in case you're interested. So that's the consumer that has time can look up and find PFAS free products. Another way that we explored was to come up with a different uh, rationale for these people and basically say, look, these chemicals are very unique, but because of their persistence and their toxicity, you should really only use them when there's an important need, and we call that the essential use concept. And that is actually not a very new concept because it was used by the Montreal Protocol. And the bar for this use is very high. It's something that is necessary for the health or safety or the functioning of society. So the Montreal Protocol, so a little while ago, you might remember we had an ozone hole, and that was due to certain chemicals that had carbon fluorine, fluorocarbons. And then eventually it was agreed that those were causing the depletion of ozone high up in the stratosphere. When that when then finally the global community agreed on doing something about the ozone hole, it was not that all these chemicals were banned straight away, but some of the uses that were not necessary were phased out quickly, like the use of these propellants in spray cans that we consumers would use because there are alternatives. But in some more important applications, there was a restriction and they could be used for a while till a better alternative was found. So that's where this idea of essentiality was first introduced and very successfully. You see how some of the chlorofluorocarbons were that was the problem where phased out fairly quickly, but then there was a slow replacement of the more important needed and uses. And in the case of the um, ozone depleting substances, what was introduced were not as bad alternatives, so that were not as stable hydro HCFCs, and eventually we got rid of we are getting rid of those right now because of the greenhouse gas potentials. But so this was a success story of saying, look. Let's look at essential uses or not so essential uses. And so the same you can apply for PFASs, non-essential are those where really you don't need them because you have alternatives. And so there's PFAS on dental floss, there's such thing as water repellent surface shorts, and there's ski waxes. In all cases, clearly we have alternatives that work just as fun. And we have uses where we have come to see substitutions are being available such as for the liquid slim forming foams across Europe and now of course across the DOD, we have non-fluorine containing mixtures that do just as good a job in almost all cases. But there still leaves segments where certain medical devices, I believe heart stands made of Teflon, there's other things made of Teflon where right now you just say you have no alternative, of course you want to have um, safe medical devices, some product protective clothing, in, in medicine, but also for firefighters, uses PFAS. So for now, those of course remain on the market. And then we came up with a list of kind of products that you could easily substitute where it's more difficult and so on. So this was, I just picked a few ones where it's somewhat easy. For textiles, the use is basically not essential water repellency you can achieve through other aims. There's an asterisk just saying, well, there's the protective gear for firefighters and for medical professionals where sometimes you still need PFASs. And there has been some progress being made. Medical equipment, I don't think much progress has been made because, you know, obviously it, <laughs> you don't play around with trying other things if what you have right now is safe. Uh, solar panels, I have absolutely no idea if much progress has been made in replacing PFASs in them. Um, construction materials, I don't think the use is essential because clearly we've been building houses for hundreds of years. And so substitutes are probably available. But of course, you end up now always having discussions on what is good in terms of uh, insulating homes to make it very energy efficient. At the same time, you don't want to contaminate the environment or the indoor air through whatever you use. Household products, I uh, don't think there's anything that is just essential. So typically we can just get something else. So alternatives exist everywhere. 
And fire abiding, as I said, this was basically by uh, the Defense Authorization Act had language attached that banned the use of AFFF in almost all instances on for DOD. I think only aircraft carriers still allowed to use AFFF. A lot of states have instituted buyback programs, so where they basically buy back AFFF from the fire departments, and offer them something else. So basically, AFFF is hopefully mostly a problem of the past. I mean, it's still a huge problem because there's hundreds of sites and all of them are expensive to clean up. Um, the question of litigation due to ex occupational exposure, and it's the tricky part is always to show that that causality, which was as was discussed in those those movies and the documentaries for people living around a production of that particular site that was finally proven by agreed upon terms. So that, that has happened and certainly there have been lawsuits based on that. And firefighters, because are very worried about their health and I think at this stage cancer has surpassed heart attacks as the main cause of death for firefighters. And of course they're exposed to a wide range of chemicals and toxic smoke, but nonetheless, they are, I believe, battling this out. A little more tricky is um, the occupation exposure for people who might actually not be aware that they have much higher exposure to PFAS. So let me then go to the next slide. So we know through correlation, not, ne not, not necessarily through direct causation, but we know through correlation that if you have a much higher concentration of PFAS in your indoor air, you end up seeing higher concentration in a lot of people living in that home. And that has been shown in several studies. So that means if you work in an environment where you have, where you sell or produce or store compound, sorry, products that have traditionally used PFASs for surface protection, for example, you will have a much higher exposure, exposure risk, but most people probably do not know. We use that to our advantage for some some of our indoor air studies. So these very high concentrations here were two carpet stores. As I said, I think modern carpets do not have PFAS, but of course carpet stores store a wide range of carpets. So there's certainly a high concentration of PFASs. We see, we used an outdoor clothing store and it was a storage facility. They have fairly high concentrations because of course they have a lot of garment and they do lose um, some of the chemicals over time. So those are just examples where we went on purpose because we wanted to have a place where we, we expect concentration to be high. There are probably many other locations where we have above average concentrations. But maybe just as a, again, the question, how do you know? And the simple answer is we cannot predict. These are a range of offices and laboratories at the university where I work. We have some we have no detects and we have one or two which are really high and we have basically no idea why that is. So with that, I'm getting close to the end. And the question was raised in the pre-discussions to today, what kind of studies are coming up that are going to be important. And certainly EPA is going to make a decision on making, instituting a maximum contaminant level in drinking water or MCL. Right now, that would have been only for PFOA and PFOS. Um, the current status, it might not be as protective as what some of the New England states, Michigan, New Jersey, California have done, but it would be federal MCL, so it would bind and would be binding for all the states. So even those that have not done anything suddenly would have to check, make sure the drink water is safe. So that's a big one. And timeline probably one or year, two years. Several other states during the European Union, and of course, we don't know what's happening in Washington, and states are doing their own, is to work on something like implementing the essential use for phasing out PFASs, and several states set their own MCLs. And then, of course, as I said, there's plenty of bills pending in different states or washing to restrict PFASs in a much wider range of products. And the, the focus on consumer products is important because it's the most obvious and easy way to reduce exposure for everybody. Drinking water, of course, is important because some communities are extremely highly exposed, but 
the average American is not that highly exposed to water, but some products we all have. And then finally, EPA has also promised to look into designating PFOA and PFOS as surplus substances or basically Superfund substances. Once that is done, you can start cleaning up contaminated sites and that will of course trigger a lot of investment funding and probably litigation as always. So with that, um, what a big surprise, PFAS have emerged as dominant contaminants around the globe basically. The focus initially has been on child drinking water, but now also can we restrict their use in other um, situations. There's some progress, at least for the HFLF, some consumer products, but as I point out, lack of awareness and easy substitution make mess of course difficult. Some companies are very forward looking, so they've been very active in identifying their uses and try to get rid of them, but that is that are only few. And of course, not a big surprise, litigation is picking up because it's it's expensive to clean up, expensive to test, so everybody wants to not be the one having to pay the bill for all of this. So thanks to our funding and with that. My part is over for now, but happy to take questions as time allows. Back to NDW. Thank you, Professor Lohman. Um, and uh, really, really do appreciate that, uh, you know, just the sheer ubiquity and, and persistence of these chemicals and the lack of awareness, I think is, you know, certainly maybe a cause for concern. And I hadn't even thought about that COVID angle. That was really interesting. Um, a few people are asking about the slides again. The slides will be distributed if you are an ISO Averis participant. We will put them out in circular. The presentation itself that you just heard is going to be on the veris.com slash EI, as in Emerging Issues website. So um, those both those resources will be available after the presentation. So um, just wanted to get that out of the way. Professor Lohman, if I can, I have a few questions. I know I'm not going to, be able to get to all of them today, but uh, one of them that came in to us, and before you answer, I would just caution, please, let's not get into specific uh, names of companies. But uh, the question was, is the Gen X replacement chemical in the PFAS family, and what is known about the effects of Gen X? Sure. Okay. So we shall not disclose who made Gen X. Um, yes, it is a PFAS chemical. It was instituted as a replacement for PFOA, and so the company uses this to make um, produce Teflon. And what we know about it is um, it's, it's much more volatile. So in the Wilmington area, I believe, um, after heavy rains, you have foam building up in some gutters because it has been washed out of the atmosphere through rain, and then it starts to bubble because it's a surfactant. It's, it's it's, I think toxicity-wise, it's not a big difference to PFOA. What is different is that PFOA resides in humans for several years. So it's a very long half-life in, in the human body. Gen X, because of its, the way it's made, um, leaves the human body much quicker. So the, if you look at human blood levels, you often don't find it. That unfortunately does not mean that there's no risk, it just means the risk is different because the risk now is really how much you consume on a daily basis. But it's not as long lived, so that's why there's less concern. That, that makes sense with the shorter half-life. Uh, Professor Lohman, we, do, we did have another question here, and I know towards the end you did touch on that uh, perhaps concerns about drinking water may be, may be overstated a little bit, but the, nonetheless, the question came in, are there any reliable, effective methods for removing PFAS from drinking water sources? And I guess I would probably add to that, you know, for agricultural sources as well. Yeah, maybe first, no, I'm not saying the drinking water concerns are overblown. I'm just, I was trying to say it's not the, for the general public, that was probably not the main exposure pathways. But those communities that have high exposure, for them it was certainly highly dangerous that's why basically on every side that is known the responsible party eventually had to pony up and then either produce bottled water and then in 
install filtration. And filtration at this point often just means uh, what we call pump and treat. So you basically pump up the water, then you put it through big filters, typically carbon filters. And that's the most reliable way of removing chemicals, including PFOA, PFOS. And that's what Barnstable has done. They do a good job as long as you have to worry about the PFOS, PFOA, and chemicals like that. Unfortunately, if you have Gen X in your water, Gen X is much more mobile. It doesn't stick well to carbon, so then you can't use that. So I believe the city of Wilmington has introduced reverse osmosis. That's a much, it's much more expensive, it's more powerful. And it basically, um, instead of passing, passing water through a filter, you basically have water diffusing through membranes and the, the big solutes, so the chemicals are basically cannot pass through the membrane. Um, you end up with a waste stream that's almost 10% of the water you treat. So you have a big problem of logistics, what to do with the water that, or the, 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 the residual, which has all the chemicals concentrated. But that's how you can clean up water if you need at a specific site. So those are the two most common methods, either big filters, carbon filters, or reverse osmosis. And you can do this, use the same in your home. Both exist for installing under your kitchen sink or wherever you want to use your water. Great, thank you. Uh, first of all, another question came in that we're hoping you can address. Uh, are PFAS still used in fast food wrappers? And if they're not, uh, can you give us a time frame when they were phased out? Uh, no, they haven't been phased out completely. That's what makes it so difficult because even those biodegradable, whatever, compostable, it's unclear what they use. So no, at this point, it's not as if there's a universal phase out. There's certainly been pressure on companies, big companies to phase them out, but there's no blanket ban in the US at all. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question that came in, I know we've got just a few minutes left here. Maybe I can put another one before you. Um, PFAS does not biodegrade naturally, but is there a way to completely remove them? Yes. Um, if you have if you have the money, yes. So there's all kinds of fancy chemistries or physical methods that you can destroy PFASs. And I think the, the least fancy is just incineration, as long as you have a high enough temperature, you probably destroy most of them. But of course, there's a big difference between doing control studies, control burns, and then having a municipal waste incinerator taking care of those. So enough energy to certainly destroys the bonds. And then there's all kinds of other fancy chemistries where you use um, electrolytical approaches, or you use um, plasma. I mean, it doesn't matter anything that produces enough energy or has strong enough reagents will eventually attack those bonds. But what you need, because they're the very expensive solutions, is you probably want to concentrate your PFASs first and then destroy those. It will not be viable for any drinking water supplier to have some fancy removal, but it becomes an option for industrial size, size contaminated by AFFF. So we have high concentration, then those other solutions become important or become viable. Great, thank you. Uh, looks like we are just about coming up on the hour. So um, Professor Lohman, I'm going to uh, relieve you of, uh, of all these questions. I want to get my slide up here so people can still reach out. There's my email and my phone number. Again, veris.com slash EI. Keep an eye there. We will be posting this webinar. That is our intent. For Professor Lohman and the Veris Emerging Issues team, thank you for spending time with us. Please stay safe and be well, everyone. Thank you for joining.